James Honeyborn, first of all, how did you get involved with Blue Planet 2? Well, um, back in 2013, we were looking for a new series to make, and I was really keen um, that we should uh, take on the oceans. The thing about the oceans are, um, you know, they're vast, they cover 70% of the world's surface, they're still largely unknown. You see maps that show you um, the ocean landscape, but actually they're just taken from satellite measurements. No one's really been down uh, and seen what's down there. You know, ships have only scanned 20% of the seabed. We've only seen with our own eyes you know, a fraction of 1% of the sea. Um, so there's so much still to discover about it. There's new science, new technology. It felt like a whole sort of generational change had been happening in the oceans and a great opportunity for us to tell new stories. Now, I understand that the working title was Oceans, and you can also see it in the show at a few times. Um, but, you know, like, was the show always intended to be connected to the original The Blue Planet from 2001? So um, we knew that we wanted to make a series of the same scale and breadth of ambition as the original series, but it would have been a bit presumptive to have started off saying, hey, this is the next Blue Planet, you know, so we have to, we wanted to make sure that we were doing it right, and, and we, we wanted to um, start by saying this is an ocean series. Uh, it was always a working title, and then when it became clear that uh, we felt we did have something that was uh, sizable and uh, significant, uh, you know, we could start to feel confident about calling it that. But you wouldn't want to just go out straight away and say that, would you? Because like from IMDb, it doesn't look like you were involved with that one. Did you have a lot of carryover in terms of crew? Right. So uh, I was around in the Natural History Unit when we made the first series, but actually they set out to make that back in 97. Uh, and so that's 20 years ago and that means there's been a whole generational shift um, and that includes not only the science and the technology but also a lot of the camera camera talent um, we do we did actually have some people on the team who worked on the original series as well so there's that inherited knowledge that's built up over time um, but whilst that was going on I was making other um, underwater films free diving films things like that and um, uh, I always wanted to be involved in the original series and it's great to have had the chance to to do this um, the second season and what do you think are the biggest updates uh, that we've gotten, you know, since the first one? Right. So uh, really, the our, our understanding of the ocean has fundamentally changed. Our understanding of of our impact on the ocean has also changed. Um, but there's new technologies. There's off the shelf technologies which are amazing. So, for example, we now have rebreathers, uh, commonly used, and that means we don't make bubbles when we dive underwater. So you can hang out with fish. And you can hang out with them for a long period of time because these rebreathers allow you to stay underwater for maybe four hours at a time. And, and when you're not producing any bubbles, there's no visual disturbance, there's no sound, and the fish just let you into their world. And, and that's why, really, for the first time, we can we can look a fish in the eyes and, and get to see its character. And it's that sense of unfolding character and personality and sophistication that, you know, we just don't expect to see in fish. So when we start seeing it, it blows your mind. Um, that's a sort of uh, one of the technological differences that's come along. Uh, we also had to build a whole range of technologies. Um, we wanted to, to contextualize sort of above and below the ocean when we're dealing with surface animals. So we built a huge mega dome, a 24 inch uh, dome port that allows us to sort of slice the ocean in half, see above and below at the same time. Um, and camera sensitivity has, has hugely increased since the first series. Um, so we can uh, now build probe lenses that allow us to to go in between the branches of coral and get a fish eyes perspective of, of the reef or, um, um, you know, and, and get good exposure on that. Uh, we've also been able to film at lower light levels than ever before. So, uh, you know, the amazing biofluorescence of rays at night flying through, um, you know, glowing water, um, you know, it's something we, we couldn't even capture when we set out to make the series back in 2013. It's only uh, that technology coming available in sort of 2016 that we were able to go out and film stuff. So we really do, um, you know, take advances as, as they become available to us to tell new stories. And, and that's what it's ultimately all about. The technology is great, but it's always in pursuit of, of new stories. And what do you think about the public appetite for the show? Like it was the most watched show in the United Kingdom of 2017. Uh, why do you think people want to see the ocean so much? What was lovely for us, it was the most watched show. It was also sort of critics choice. So, it, you know, it seemed to go down well uh, across the board. Um, and also um, in China, you know, uh, 225 million views uh, during the simultaneous broadcast with, with UK. Um, that sort of volume is just, it's so rewarding for us as documentary filmmakers. You know? 
Um, why? Um, I think it's a world that people don't naturally feel connected to. You know, it's out of sight and out of mind. To many people, uh, sea creatures are cold, you know, alien, remote, slimy, weird looking. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a dangerous place to be. It's not necessarily a world that we connect to our own. But if, if we can help by taking people into that world, by immersing them in this incredible, colorful, characterful world that exists, um, then perhaps we can all start to feel a closer connection to that world and see it as part of our world, an extension of our world. Uh, and so for us, those characterful stories are so important because once you meet an animal and you realize the challenges it faces and you see there are kind of parallels with our lives, then you have a lot more empathy for it. And so that was what, that was what our ambition was, was to, to connect people uh, you know, in perhaps ways they haven't been before to, to life in the world. Yeah, in addition to critics, I've seen that like it's also very popular with you know all the people who watched it on IMDb. You're the now in the top ten shows uh, ever, I guess, based on rating. Right. Yeah, you guys are number ten, and The Sopranos is number eleven. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, it's just look, it's great for us to to know that people, you know, who would have thought marine biology and oceanography could engage such an audience, you know? But but it's part of our world, and it's the world that we don't know. And going back to what I said at the beginning about so the scale of this place, you know, there's still so much to explore, and it's so important to us. So so for us, you know, who are passionate about the ocean, it's it's a thrill to to find these stories. Um, you know, newness is so important to us. It, it, and so the scientific community have been incredibly supportive. We go and we go and work with them, and we find new stories, and we discover things together. You know, there's 13 scientific papers being written on um, behavior we discovered whilst filming, which is just amazing. So we're kind of really collaborating um, to explore this last great frontier on the planet, and that's a thrill to then share it, and then to have, to, to know that people are watching it and loving it is just that's the best. There's a line in the series that stuck out to me uh, that kind of relates to what you're saying about how, you know, it's the last frontier of the planet, how we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about, you know, the depths of the ocean. Do you feel like that's just, or do you feel like, you know, maybe you'll move toward looking at Mars for your next documentary series, or, yeah, or what's your take on space? So, uh, space exploration is exciting. Um, I think ocean exploration uh, feels a lot more relevant to our lives right now. Um, there is still so much yet we don't know. You know, on these submarine dives, they often see new species. They see things that people don't really fully understand yet. If we don't yet know our own planet, why are we always wanting to go out and explore the other ones? I think, you know, there's a, there's a relevance issue. And also, you know, um, the health of the world's oceans is really important to us. You know, every breath we take, that's oxygen. Half the oxygen on the planet is created in the oceans. We need a healthy ocean for our own survival as we career as a planet through space. So, so um, I just feel it's, it's relevant and, um, and vitally important to us that we understand it better than we do currently. That's why it's so exciting. That's why ocean exploration has got such a long way to go. So as the series goes on increasingly, uh, and especially in the last episode, it talks about not just like how the oceans are, but also like why they are and what people should be doing. Uh, so what would you say uh, to viewers who saw Blue Planet 2, like what are some everyday things that people should be doing to better preserve the oceans? Well, I think the most important thing is that we feel we can all make a difference and we can all make a difference through the uh, choices we make on a daily basis. Um, one of the things that's really caught people's attention over here in the UK is plastics, marine plastics. You know, we know it's a huge issue and it's become part of the, the conversation over here. Um, it's been talked about by many politicians since Blue Planet came out. There's been this sort of um, wave of interest in plastics and it's led to some new um, taxes against plastics, to, to, pe to mass beach cleans, to all sorts of movements, sort of really looking at you know, what are we doing to our oceans and how are we polluting it? So, um, you know, that then raises the question to the viewer, well, what can I do with, with my, if I think plastics getting into the ocean is not, not such a good thing, what can I do? You know, and, and I think people, you know, they very quickly, um, you know, realize they can uh, refuse plastic packaging, then they can recycle um, their plastic better and more. Um, you know, they, they can do other things that, that, that allow, that perhaps will make a bit of a difference. Um, 
and um, you know, reusing plastics more than once. So, so taking away um, the dependence on single-use plastics. You know, there's been a bit of a straw revolution over here. I noticed that one of the bars next to where we work, they're now, they're now, uh, they've, they've, they've stopped serving plastic straws and drinks. They now put pasta straws and drinks. So, I guess there's, there's lots of different solutions that people are coming up to. But it's certainly something where we've been able to turn a spotlight on, on a subject. And you know, we didn't set out to campaign about it, but we wanted to tell stories about the oceans today, contemporary stories, and we wanted it to feel um, relevant and we wanted to tell it how it was. And when we went out there, we saw plastic pollution everywhere. So we showed it. And and the response we've seen is great. And I hope people do feel empowered, viewers do feel empowered on, on a daily basis. So that's just one example. Tell me about the difference that the uh, that uh, Blue Planet 2 made, not to kind of the general public, but to more of the scientific community. What advances were we able to make for them? Well, I hear there's an awful lot of people applying for marine biology courses, so that's a great thing. Um, they talk about the Blue Planet effect in the universities. Uh, you know, a lot of people wanting to study that, the area now, which is great. Um, I think uh, what I'd like to think is that we can have a closer collaboration with science moving forward. And what I think we've shown on this series is that we can work hand in hand. You know, the oceans, they're remote, they're difficult to access, they're very expensive to access. To be able to collaborate and, and go out together on expeditions and discover stuff and film it at the same time. You know, our film has a value to observational behavioral scientists, for example. So we can, you know, th th there's genuine collaboration to be had and that, and that feels great. It feels like that's where we should be. And, um, you know, it really is a frontier of new discovery. What about like, uh, like technological advances though? Like, is there anything that you said, like, you know, this wasn't happening before we found it and I don't know. <laughs> They kind of discovers. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. So we we film things that haven't really been recorded before. For example, there's an octopus um, that when he's pestered by sharks, he he builds himself a shell suit of protective armor, uh, and that behavior has never even been recorded by science before. So by literally just filming it, um, someone can now write a scientific paper and describe that, and it's now kind of added to the sum of world knowledge. You know, that's that's pretty cool. We're the first people to film um, those those giant valleys leaping out of the water and catching birds in midair. Uh, and that's filmed in slow-mo detail, which scientists can now study and work out you know, exactly what these fish are doing. So uh, in many different levels, um, you know, we, we've, I guess just by being there, you become an eyewitness for it. But also you start to witness some of the really big major events that have happened in the ocean over the last few years, like for example, coral bleaching. And um, in 2016, and then again in 2017, we had unprecedented two years in a row coral breach, bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, and 50% of the reef was badly affected um, by these high seawater temperatures that killed the coral in many areas. And if you look at the coral reef today, the Great Barrier Reef today, it is um, a shadow of its former self. Um, and by being there and documenting it, we can hopefully raise awareness, which which is relevant to all sorts of science and um, you know, issues around um, the global uh, trends towards the warming sea and, uh, and change in the climate, for example. Now, my number one question while watching the show was uh, not about kind of I guess uh, what we saw on screen, but how you must have had so much footage, and I just you know, how did you decide, you know, what goes where, what stories you're going to tell, how you're going to jump from one thing? Did you have it all mapped out kind of before you shot anything and you knew just like the general narrative beats that you wanted to hit across seven episodes? Or is it more, you know, you take everything in and then somehow piecing together uh, a show? Yeah, good question. So the first thing we have to do is decide what is it? What is it? What's our story going to be? And um, I always feel it's very really important that each episode feels very different. So uh, we wanted to base the series around different habitats, the green seas, the big blue of the open ocean, the darkness of the deep, you know, they, and so the, the series began to spit up very nicely, you know, the color of the coral reefs. Um, but of course, we wanted a, um, a sort of a showcase opening show as well. 
Um, and then the final episode we knew would be about uh, these new frontiers of, of uh, discovery and the scientists and the conservationists on the front line of working in the changing oceans. So, so um, once we had that split, we're then really talking to the scientists and trying to find stories that, that would fit nicely in each episode. And from that, we kind of shape an overall sort of narrative arc for the show. Um, we will go as far as um, as to try and even storyboard what we hope we will be able to film the animals doing. We kind of need that rigour, um, really, to get everyone on the same page before an expedition goes out. And by the way, we had 125 expeditions to 39 countries. That's 6,000 hours underwater uh, and 1,000 hours in the deep ocean. And um, uh, but of course, nature doesn't read the script, and what we come back with is often quite different from what we've set out to get. Um, and, and then we're really into a pace, uh, place of sort of refining the footage and the edits and our overall stories uh, and reshaping. And that continual molding and polishing goes on right the way through to the fine cut. Um, but all the way through, we're keeping tabs on how the how the filming's progressing. Uh, but you you can't ever make up for the fact that some big curveballs come into the equation. For example, back in 2014, we went to film something um, called a boiling sea, an event where, where um, small fish, lanternfish, get trapped at the surface of the ocean. These big tuna are coming in and, and hitting them, and the whole sea erupts in foam. Uh, and we went to a place in Australia where this was pretty much known to happen, and it didn't happen at all. And we couldn't work out why. And we'd invested a lot of time and effort and, and money in the shoot and came back with nothing. Um, and it was only six months later that it was confirmed to be the, the starting place and time of El Nino this big climatic shift that then echoed through our next 18 year, 18 months of filming. Uh, and El Nino is a real problem for us because it means that um, all the predicted normal behaviours don't happen quite how you'd normally expect because everything's different in the scene. And, uh, and that was a major challenge for us. That was something we could never have predicted or, or um, prepared for. You've just got to ride those things and try and stick to your story and modify your story and, and um, you know, and so the films evolve. And uh, tell me about what your duties are as executive producer. I, I feel like you know everybody's so obsessed with you know tour theory uh, and the showrunner, but there's also a series producer on your show. So, are you on top? Is he on top? Uh, do you guys like? Are you there during all the filming? Are you mostly in the office? I feel like what your role uh, as an executive producer would be would be very different uh, from kind of more uh, fiction uh, exe executive right. producers. Yeah. Sure. So um, kind of we're all in it together. And um, myself and the series producer, Mark Brando, we have a good working relationship um, and a close one. We've worked together as directors coming up through the ranks of the BBC Natural History Unit. Um, we have slightly different roles in this. This was a kind of... Um, I, I was the creator of the idea, so I then had to go and win the business um, for the series that was Oceans and is now Blue Planet 2. Um, I, you know, I had to go out and, and win that and get the funding together and then put together the team. I asked Mark to come and join me and together we selected the rest of the team and together, you know, he would always um, bring every story and every film script um, to me and we would talk through them together. It's a collaborative, uh, of, uh, you know, of, collaborative thing on many many levels uh, on a day-to-day -day basis the series producer is also really looking after the health and safety of all these expeditions when you've got 125 expeditions going out uh, you know there's a lot of people involved we don't just have our core team of 25 people uh, in Bristol we have probably a thousand people around the world you know and a third of our filming was actually done by local cinematographers all around the world so um, you know huge amounts of, of um, of uh, expeditions, but also huge amounts of filming activity going on uh, at any one time. And um, and then we need to see the material as, come, as it's coming back in, and, and we'll review that together. Um, and really um, just, you know, it, it, we need people, as many people, as many brains on, on this as, as we can, as all the material starts coming back in. Mark would do some expeditions, I would do others. Uh, I was fortunate enough to um, be on the submarine expedition to Antarctica where we discovered incredible life at a thousand meters. And that was the first time submarines had ever been deep in Antarctica. So uh, I do get to escape the office occasionally, but not as much as the producers and the directors who are, who are very much on the cold face of filming and out there diving and, and uh, filming every day. So it's a it's a big collaborative team effort, and 
you know, it needs a huge team to do this. And finally, we're coming up on the Emmys, but right now we're actually in the middle of the BAFTAs, where I believe you're nominated for seven and you've already won two. So can you tell me about that recognition and I guess what you expect from the ceremony next weekend? Right. So, um, yeah, it's always amazing um, when, you, when you're up for a BAFTA. Um, we've had the craft BAFTAs. We got cinematography and sound, which is, which is lovely. Great recognition for the teams. Um, and next week, it's the kind of the TV BAFTAs. So we're up for... Um, best series and also TV moment. And the TV moment is a moment where a mother, um, a, a mother whale is grieving for her lost baby that's died because of um, chemical pollution. And um, and we're talking about the role plastics might even play in that. So um, so we're up for two things there. It's it's a great day out. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to be there. Um, my wife is expecting a baby next week, and we'll have to see if I can make it. <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations either way then, and uh, we look forward to seeing you later at the Emmys. Well, uh, yeah, very exciting. Thank you.